Good evening. Um, my name is Declan Kiley, and I am the director of the library special collections and exhibitions. And it's my distinct uh, honor to welcome uh, you to tonight's event um, to, and to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Emma Smith. Emma is a professor of Shakespeare studies at Hartford College, Oxford. She has published several books on Shakespeare's first folio, including in 2015, uh, the Making of Shakespeare's First Folio, and the following year, Shakespeare's First Folio, Four Centuries of an Iconic Book. Emma is also the editor of the Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare's First Folio, and I should say, I think I've already said this to Emma uh, this afternoon, that these uh, deeply researched and beautifully written books uh, were indispensable sources for me when I was drafting label copy for the library's first folios um, that uh, we'll put on display next month. Emma is also the author, most recently, of the book Portable Magic, A History of Books and Their Readers. This collection of essays spans centuries, continents, and a wide array of writers. It's a profound and absolutely delightful rumination on our obsession with books as objects. The American edition is quite a beautiful object in its own right. Uh, you will have seen copies um, outside. And uh, fortunately, as I say, it's available for sale, and Emma will be glad to sign copies uh, for you this evening. You can, of course, also check it out at one of our many branches with your library card. Um, but however you get it into your hands, I cannot encourage you enough to make sure you read it. It's a really, really wonderful book. Um, in fact, it was one of the most enjoyable books I read in 2022. I uh, recommended it to all of my friends and many colleagues. Professor Smith's chapter titles and subtitles are particularly engaging and memorable. For instance, chapter 10 in Portable Magic is subtitled, this is the chapter on censorship, is subtitled 237 Goddams, 58 Bastards, 31 Christ's Sakes, and One Fart. <laughs> Portable Magic is also the inspiration for Emma's talk tonight, but it's also it also inspired, uh, in part, um, by the exhibition, by the library's exhibition, Treasures, downstairs. Um, as I read Emma's book last year, it inspired a lot of new thinking uh, for me uh, about our ongoing uh, exhibition. And it also made me think again about how we regard and value books in the digital age. Um, Emma writes in her introduction that books are culturally and materially important precisely because they are democratic and everyday not because they are too valuable to touch. And she also says, books are ordinary things that become special in the unpredictable and unique human connections they embody and extend. We all encounter rare and valuable books all the time. Well, those of you who want to continue to encounter rare and valuable books will find many examples uh, in our Treasures exhibition, and as I mentioned before, from April 24th, you'll be able to see for the first time all six of our first folio editions of Shakespeare's plays side by side. Um, the exhibition is best explored in person, but if you can't see it, the entire exhibition is also available on our website, mypl.org slash treasures. After her talk, Emma will be glad to answer some of your questions. Uh, if you're here in the room, please write your questions down on the note cards we've provided on your seats. Uh, one of my library colleagues will come and pick them up from you uh, during the talk. And if you're watching online, you can submit your questions in the chat or email them to publicprograms at mypl.org. Treasures programming is made possible by the estate of Helen Sisserson. Live from MYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Isbahana Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and of course, by all of you. Thank you for your support, thank you for being here, and please join me in welcoming Professor Emma Smith. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is an enormous privilege for me, an enormous treat for me. Anybody who loves books, uh, like all of us, will just find you know, a kind of lock-in at the 
library. How, how, what more could we ask for? So this is a really wonderful uh, occasion for me. I'm sorry if I'm slightly squinting. It's quite a lot of light, uh, which is, must be what it's like to be uh, an, uh, a stage actor. We have had a bit of trouble with the title of my talk uh, this evening. I originally asked, is it always bad to burn books? And we wondered whether, in fact, that seemed a tendentious or a, a difficult proposition, and we settled to this uh, title that I've got now, uh, Why Do We Still uh, Burn Books? Uh, but it attests to the way this topic has become in extremely contested, extremely difficult. And one of the things I want to try and do uh, in my talk this evening is to step back a bit from uh, the... Uh, very fraught and sort of overdetermined symbolism of book burning to kind of see where how we got to this point, uh, to take, if you like, some of the heat out of that question, uh, and to think a bit more broadly about what book burning specifically, not as a sim as a metaphor for uh, censorship, but as a physical act, uh, what that tells us about our relationship with books uh, as objects. And I wanted to begin with this brilliant image of Margaret Atwood um, taking a flamethrower to a copy of her own uh, great book, The Handmaid's Tale. Um, we'll, we'll look at it a bit more detail at this particular copy of the book, um, but it's a slightly gleeful image. That's what I rather enjoyed about it. Um, it's an image which is against censorship. Um, uh, that's what this... Uh, Fireproof book has has been designed to uh, to demonstrate, uh, but it also shows a kind of delight somehow in the the transgressive sense that you might you might uh, set fire to a book. That's where I wanted to begin. Book burning is, I think, as old as books themselves. From the third century China to contemporary America, we can recognise this phenomenon. Um, and we can see, I think, that it operates as a piece of theatre. In very few cases, as I'm going to go on to talk about, does the burning of books materially restrict their ideas or their circulation? So that's not what it's for. Instead, it's a kind of communal ritual of condemnation uh, and against and solidarity with a particular point of view. And it's that sense of theatre that I want to try and explore as part of my talk this evening. Let's look at Margaret Atwood's book in a little bit more detail. The um, uh, inflammable or non-flammable book uh, ha is uh, a valuable property, as you can see here, um, uh, described in uh, nice booksellers uh, detail and sold uh, for a uh, freedom of speech publishing charity. The unburnable book comes for Atwood to be the sign of defiance and liberty. And I want to trace how book burning has developed that kind of iconography, that the unburnable book uh, is the symbol of liberty. So I began by saying that book burning was as old as books. And in fact, let's start first with one particular uh, phenomenon, one particular trope, let's say, in the history of books and libraries. It is almost inevitable, I hardly dare say it here really, so it seems almost inevitable that a library is going to burn down. That's been the case since the stories about the Library of Alexandria, which probably didn't actually burn down uh, in the way that we think, uh, but nevertheless has provided the kind of template for the narrative of loss, which is always the dark side or the shadow side of the narratives of preservation that are so intrinsic to the library. I wanted to think uh, here in this building, particularly, although I gather to my disappointment that it wasn't actually filmed here, uh, about the um, disaster movie The Day After Tomorrow, which you may remember uh, sees uh, a, a number of survivors of a uh, climate catastrophe which has hit New York uh, arrive here in the New York Public Library. And they, uh, in order to try and keep warm, they begin a terrible program of burning books. Uh, and there's a wonderful scene. If you, if you don't know this uh, movie and you're a, uh, a friend of the New York Public Library, you ought, to go and, uh, you ought to go and see it because the moment when the librarian uh, keeps hold of 
uh, a copy of Gutenberg's Bible and says, you are not going to burn this, uh, is the moment when uh, the story actually turns and we realize uh, it's all going to be okay. It actually is all going to be uh, all right. But nevertheless, the, the symbol of, of burning, of book burning within the library uh, is uh, a kind of it, it, it inevitable transgression. It's a bit like Margaret Atwood uh, pointing the flamethrower uh, at her own book. And I wanted to think about a more, uh, an, another filmic example, but a, uh, one which um, draws on these deep-seated uh, myths uh, and myths of origin. This is uh, a scene from the last uh, of the Star Wars films, The Last Jedi. Uh, you might remember in that film uh, that one of the, uh, part of the backstory that has been invented for the Jedi is a set of lovingly invented scriptural texts. Uh, they are uh, leather-bound, uh, full of blue um, uh, uh, color and gold uh, and uh, careful cal calligraphic lettering. They are signaling themselves as scriptural books that would have been recognizable to uh, early Christian um, Bible scribes uh, and uh, uh, religious book users across history. But like uh, all these other libraries too, uh, the Jedi scriptures burn. Um, uh, Yoda is unmoved by this uh, in his characteristic uh, syntax. Uh, he remarks, uh, page turners, they were not. Um, although, in fact, I won't spoil the ending for you, but it turns out that the books are not, in fact, burned. The fear of burning uh, books, I think, is perhaps why uh, my own library, the Bodleian Library, makes uh, kindling a flame within the library, uh, such uh, 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 an object of horror, and the, the, one of the many things uh, a reader at that library must um, uh, commit uh, not to do. I tried to find the equivalent for the New York Public Library, but that has a much, much longer set of um, uh, instructions, uh, many of which seem to be uh, about uh, how to use the restrooms um, ap <laughs> ap appropriately. Um, but I, I think it probably it isn't uh, allowed to kindle a fire uh, here, although I'm not sure it's quite so explicitly forbidden. And I have sometimes wondered whether the name of Amazon's uh, book-guzzling engine, Kindle, might not in some weird universe uh, correspond to this uh, fear of, of the burning of books. So what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes then uh, is the way that burning books has come to be particularly meaningful and the way that we have got in the 21st century uh, to the point of extreme uh, engagement with and extreme high emotions around book burning uh, as a phenomenon. Most of these acts of book burning are public, but I wanted to start, because it's fun, with one private one. This is Samuel Pepys, the 17th century English diarist. And in this anecdote, he is Pepys by name and Pepys by nature. At the beginning of 1668, Pepys comes to hear of a raunchy book uh, imported from France, written in French, called L'Ecole des Filles. He is obviously very taken with this book and keeps going back to the bookseller to have a look at it. But three weeks later, he finally does buy a copy of this book. He tells in his diary that he has bought it in plain binding, avoiding the cost of better bound, because I resolve, as soon as I have read it, to burn it. Now, L'Ecole des Filles became a, a kind of byword for libertinism uh, in this period. Uh, it was very often uh, suppressed and, and uh, censored. Um, uh, only one copy uh, seems to have survived. Uh, and of course, the censorship uh, of this book uh, contributed to its notoriety. And here we, uh, here we find one uh, consequence of book burning, perhaps an unintended one, 
it raises the status enormously of the book that is burnt. Uh, it's in some ways the best thing that could happen to portable magic uh, is if there were a small demonstration uh, on the steps uh, of the New York Public Library uh, about it. Pepys had uh, originally planned to have his wife translate this book from the French, but when he read it, he realized that that would somehow be inappropriate. And on Sunday, the 9th of February, the day after he bought it, a day piously underlined in his diary as the Lord's Day, uh, he writes, he was at, I, I was at my chamber all the morning doing business, also reading Les Col des Filles, which is a mighty lewd book, but yet not amiss for a sober man wants to read over to inform himself in the villainy of the world. <laughs> so Pepys was just doing uh, his research uh, in a nice bibliographic um, version of Augustine's famous prayer, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> Pepys uh, burns the book and ends his diary entry in his characteristic way, and so to bed. But that's a really unusual act, as far as I can see, in the history of book burning. Uh, this is Pepys uh, censoring himself, uh, first enjoying the book and then thinking it was not a fit book to keep uh, in his library. Most book burning comes from a very different place, and it comes from a, a place of uh, public uh, display and theatricality. And I'm going to move uh, immediately to uh, what has become the defining uh, instance of book burning, and that's uh, the burning in many German cities on the 10th of May, 1933, by the Nazis. You'll know of Godwin's Law, which says the longer uh, any topic is, dis is, is discussed, uh, particularly online, um, the, the exponential increase in the likelihood that a comparison to the Nazis will be made. I think Godwin's Law must always be suspended in talking about book burning, because it is this uh, example which has become uh, central. And it's what I want to spend a bit of time on, because although I don't want to suggest that this did not happen, and clearly I don't want to minimize uh, the wider regime to which it, uh, it, it was in service. Nevertheless, I think that book burning in 1933 has been uh, used for different purposes uh, since then uh, and has become a kind of uh, a theme, uh, particularly in the US, as I'm going to show, uh, that's uh, slightly different, perhaps, uh, from the way it might have been intended. So on the 10th of May, 1933, uh, in a number of German cities, bonfires of books were organized. It's slightly unclear who exactly organized these uh, and how centralized uh, their organization might have been. They're mostly manned by students uh, and young people. It's a troubling, for me as working in the university, it's a very, very troubling part of the rise of uh, Hitlerism, the rise of the Nazis, that it was so deeply embedded in the youth culture of universities. The, they were, um, so there was one night, the 10th of May, 1933, when books which had been confiscated or donated for burning uh, were placed on bonfires in uh, central squares uh, and burnt, during which time fire oaths were shared uh, among the audience, uh, the spectators, where they undertook uh, the work of purification, cultural purification, that this burning was intended to symbolize. We probably all know some of the roll call of authors mostly Jewish, but not only Jewish, who were caught up uh, in, this, uh, in, in these conflagrations. Uh, works by Gide, by Freud, Marx, Zola, Brecht, uh, and by American writers too, like Hemingway uh, and Jack London. Eric Kastner, uh, who I know best as the author of Emile and the Detectives, um, but who was uh, present to watch his Weimar 
rather hedonistic novel, Fabian, uh, burnt uh, on the, on the uh, Berlin bonfires, uh, is the only author that we know to have actually uh, been present uh, at these burnings. Uh, put on at night, they were part student uh, initiation, part student prank, part, part fascist spectacle, part which is Sabbath or black mass. It's interesting when we look at how these, um, uh, how this, uh, this eve, this night, this night of book burning, uh, was received by uh, onlookers uh, both in Germany and beyond. Most of the commentary uh, in the U.S., uh, in Britain, and even in Germany itself, suggested that this had been rather um, uh, a kind of prank. Um, not a very significant uh, if set of events, something actually rather regrettable. Uh, even in Germany, that seemed to be the case. Uh, spirit, high spirits had got away with uh, these young people. Across both Germany and uh, the uh, English-speaking world, the, the, the emphasis was on the youth of the participants. Uh, and there was quite a sense uh, of... Um, quite an attempt to dissociate uh, this from uh, central uh, Nazi policy. Not, I think, because of the book burning itself, but because of the sense of disorder, uh, public disorder, that, that it might be seen to embody. This, exa this, this example here is a good one from the newspaper coverage. Um, and in fact, there was no repetition of book burning uh, in Nazi Germany. Uh, and no kind of copycat uh, burning uh, elsewhere. Again, this is not to minimize uh, the, the importance of that date and certainly not to minimize uh, the wickedness of that regime, but to place this uh, as a, perhaps a smaller impact uh, set of events uh, than we might later uh, come to think. And what I want to suggest is that it's for later um, it, it, it's a later moment in cultural history, and it's a particularly American moment, rather than a Nazi or a German one, that recreates and reconstructs book burning as central uh, to political ideology. Of course, Indiana Jones uh, is present. Um, So the book burning took place uh, in 1933. Let's fast forward a few years uh, to the America uh, of the attack on Pearl Harbor. In the month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, the great publisher W.W. Norton convenes a meeting of the great and the good of the American print world. And that meeting uh, has an agenda with two items. First, what can publishing do for the war? Second, what can the war do for publishing? Under the first heading, Norton's team, they became called the Council for Books in Wartime, um, began a massive publicity and publishing campaign to establish reading and the freedom to read as the key American freedom that was being fought for in the war. It's a really extraordinary piece of ideological maneuvering. Uh, and it's quite clear, it becomes, it's really clear to see in the, in the work that the uh, Council for um, Publishing in Wartime do, that they do with Roosevelt, with the White House, uh, and with the broader uh, kind of war mobilization effort, that the freedom to read the opposite of the restricted um, cultural environment in Nazi Germany that was uh, epitomized by book burning. That had become the most easy freedom, the most easy headline uh, to tell Americans about why they were fighting the Nazis. Roosevelt was key to this. Um, uh, his his uh, early letter, early um, 
uh, release, press release about uh, the way that books are weapons uh, in the war uh, was picked up by all kinds of uh, publicity uh, efforts. And in 1942 and 1943 and in 1944, the 10th of May was uh, retained in America as a day of remembrance for the books. It's an extraordinary moment. Uh, there was n this was not about people. This was not about the other uh, atrocities that the uh, Nazis um, might be known to have committed, uh, even at that point in the war. It's about the books. New York Public Library has a ceremony with its flags at half-mast in 1940, May 1943. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's syndicated newspaper column uh, is all about books uh, and book burning. Um, the Library Journal uh, takes as its uh, standard, in America, we do not burn books, we build libraries. And Frank Capra, right, uh, producing a series of films for newly, cons newly con um, uh, conscripted soldiers, new newly mobilized soldiers, uh, called Prelude to War, uh, used a, an, an extensive montage of uh, book-burning titles uh, to, to ram home to uh, soldiers that this was what they were fighting for. The other part of the uh, publisher's uh, work was to give soldiers those very books. So the Council for Books in Wartime uh, produced these small, uh, absolutely beautiful editions, armed services editions. They're about as big as an iPhone. They're in ho horizontal uh, landscape format. They're very soft, uh, got very soft, thin covers, uh, and uh, stapled, very simply stapled bindings. Millions of these uh, editions were printed uh, in the uh, wartime period, and there was an extremely efficient distribution mechanism to all parts uh, of the war zone uh, in crates uh, that came out uh, twice monthly. And they had an extraordinary range of titles, including, in fact, some titles uh, that were uh, restricted uh, in the American uh, market. Uh, because it was not, in fact, true that Americans had freedom to read exactly what they wanted to. Uh, there was a good deal of book censorship, particularly uh, locally. Uh, but the Council for Books on Wartime wanted to cut through uh, local censorship to produce uh, a diverse list of books that would be distributed for free uh, to soldiers. There are wonderful uh, images of soldiers uh, reading these um, at different points, uh, it's some, the, the, the poor guy in, in, uh, in, in traction uh, makes it clear that there were there were, there were lots of uh, there was lots of boredom about the, the war, uh, uh, as well as uh, excitement. And there were uh, loads and loads. Yale University has the archives, uh, and there are loads of letters from soldiers talking about reading. Uh, in between extraordinary moments of, uh, of wartime uh, activity. <clears throat> and here's a little bit more of the emphasis on book burning and book banning uh, that, was, uh, that, that was so I I important. Ten years ago, the Nazis burned these books. Uh, this is part of an um, uh, American campaign uh, in bookstores uh, in the US uh, to remember uh, in 1943 the book burning of 1933. That's to, all to say, I think, Americans were much more conscious that Nazis had burned books 10 years after it had happened than they were in the immediate aftermath when nobody particularly picked this up as a major, uh, as, as a major event. So, so Americans constructed um, themselves as contrary, contrary to book burning and fighting for the freedom to read. But there have always been difficulties uh, in that position and there were inconsistencies uh, in it even then. Let's look at it here. Um, so this piece of wartime propaganda, uh, do it right, uh, 
but fast, make this year Hitler's last, includes or illustrates this uh, injunction with, by putting a match to a copy of Mein Kampf, thus deploying exactly the kind of book burning uh, analogy uh, against the Nazis uh, that it had tried so hard to attribute entirely to them. And book burning, of course, has these kinds of intrinsic uh, difficulties in it. If you're against it, you have to be against it, however bad the books are. Uh, you can't just be against it uh, for the books that you uh, uh, kind of agree with. And the question of uh, what to do uh, with Hitler's Mein Kampf ha has been one of the um, exemplary uh, issues about difficult books and what should happen, what should happen to them. Um, and that's not something I'm going to go into this evening, but we could always uh, talk about it in the questions. The US Holocaust Memorial Museum um, estimates that 90,000 books were burnt uh, in uh, 1933. That's probably quite a high uh, estimate, and there's certainly um, a fair bit of evidence that uh, it was quite difficult to get books to burn. Uh, they don't burn particularly uh, easily because there's not enough air gets into uh, in between the pages. Uh, if you've ever tried to burn a great clump of your bank statements or something, you'll, 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 you'll know that. Um, book burning, um, as I'm gonna come back to, is a deeply inefficient way of getting rid of books. But here we've got uh, Misha Ullman's moving uh, Berlin uh, sculpture, uh, the empty library, which underground, under the square in which the burnings took place is a, are, are empty shelves um, of about the number uh, of volumes that were thought to have been, uh, been destroyed. One important thing about uh, Misha Ullman's uh, sculpture and about the post-war uh, reimagining of book burning was its discovery of a quotation from a relatively obscure uh, early 19th century German writer, Heinrich Heine. And Heine, in, a, in even, even obscure Heine's more obscure uh, work, was a play, a very Orientalist play, uh, about uh, Moorish Spain. And in it, uh, a character looking at religious intolerance uh, and at the burning of religious books uh, says... Uh, where they burn books, then there they will burn people. Heine's quotation doesn't seem to have flourished really at all, doesn't seem to have come to the fore at all until uh, the later 20th century uh, when it became the kind of go-to uh, explanation for uh, the book burning as a terrible, the Nazi book burning as a terrible proleptic understanding about uh, of, of the death camps. But it's also an equivalence which I think has some moral uh, problems with it. And here is uh, Ray Bradbury. Um, Fahrenheit 451 uh, is the uh, temperature at which books uh, do burn properly, uh, which gives an example of how, uh, how hot the fire needs to be. And Bradbury's um, science fiction futurist novel, which you may know, uh, is about a world in which firemen, firefighters, uh, go to set fire to things, particularly books, rather than put those uh, fires out. Uh, knowledge, books have been uh, outlawed, they're all to be burnt, uh, and there is, uh, at the end of the novel, there's a sense that only through people will knowledge be transmitted, not through books. Bradbury uh, talked about being influenced by the book burnings uh, in the Nazi period. And this is one of his prefaces to uh, a later edition of his uh, one great novel. When Hitler burned a book, I felt it as keenly, please forgive me, as his killing a human, for in the long sum of history, they are one and the same flesh. Now, I love books too, and we are here in a temple to books, but surely Bradbury is really wrong here. 
uh, surely, this equivalence uh, of people and books and damage to books and damage to people uh, is, is a kind of morally uh, bankrupt one. Uh, it's not actually true, necessarily true, or causally true, that where they burn books, there they will burn people. But we have constructed it uh, to be so. But not only have we constructed it to be so, uh, that, the, that there is an equivalence between burning of books and burning of people, I think we have anthropomorphized books. We have turned books into proxies uh, for ourselves. We have over-invested them with forms of value. And I say that from a position of deep overinvestment in books uh, as objects, uh, but with a, a kind of uh, horror, maybe, uh, at that, uh, those kinds of overinvestment. So book burning, that's to say, uh, has come to be horrific for two related reasons. One, the idea that books, uh, that the damage to books is uh, a, mo a kind of moral failing in itself. And the other is that the damage to books is equivalent to or a step towards uh, damage to human beings. We can see then why book burning uh, is so uh, powerful. Again, not because it destroys books. Uh, it doesn't do that at all efficiently. But because... Uh, it speaks to something very intense about our relationship with books uh, as objects, that they are not simply inanimate things that we have around us, but in all kinds of ways, and for all kinds of historical reasons, uh, overdetermined, almost living uh, objects. Uh, damage to books, a disrespect to books, uh, is a problem in many, many traditions, and it'd be interesting to hear whether that's part of your family tradition too. And I think because the first books were Bibles, bi biblio, uh, that the word that we attach to books in, in, in things like bibliography or bibliotech, uh, also is related to Bible. Books and Bibles uh, start out as the same thing. I think because of that history uh, of the sacred in the book, the object has retained that aura even though the contents uh, have changed. Let's, uh, let's draw to a close by thinking about how books really get destroyed. And that's in two ways. If we think about the physical, uh, physical destruction of books, the irony is that most of this is done by publishers. Book publishing is a huge overproduction of copies. Uh, and the biggest... Uh, pulpers, the biggest destroyers of books, are also publishers. And here you can see uh, a wonderful uh, British um, uh, recycling plant. Um, one of the things I enjoyed was that one of our motorways, our uh, high, higher speed roads, uh, was um, uh, uh, had a layer of um, romance novels pulped uh, <laughs> under, underneath it. Um, apparently as a, a sound absorber. So on the one hand, um, the, the, the industrially produced book needs actually an industrial process like large-scale pulping to destroy it uh, at an appreciable scale. But we know what the more uh, important threat to books is, uh, and that is the kinds of censorship uh, and pressure that's put on particularly school districts, school libraries, uh, the library sector, and to a lesser extent bookstores, about stocking books, um, particularly, uh, and this is obviously a particularly active uh, debate around the books that are thought suitable uh, for children uh, and for young people. So in itself, book burning, I think, is actually irrelevant. I'm not particularly advocating for it, but I am trying to suggest that it's not the most important thing. When people burn books, they're usually inadequate attention seekers rather than genocidal tyrants. But the fact that we are so uh, affected by it, that it is such a hot-button issue for us, does tell us, I think, something about our investment in books as objects we're not simply interested in their content, although that too is important, 
but that there is something uh, about their physical and material being uh, that needs our protection. That's the thing that I talk about uh, most extensively uh, in my book, uh, Portable Magic. It's, it's a title which comes from Stephen King. Stephen King, the thriller writer, in his book On Writing, which I think is a fantastic book if any of you uh, are interested, uh, not, even if you're not interested in Stephen King himself. King calls books uh, a kind of a, a, a portable, a uniquely portable magic. And I wanted to take that title from him, but also uh, the sense that in King's own uh, writing, magic is not necessarily a benign force. It's certainly a powerful one, but it has negative uh, and malign consequences too. Books do bad and difficult work in our world, as well as being uh, kind of wonderful uh, and affirming things. And as a super resilient technology, a technology which has been almost unchanged for two millennia, they continue uh, to throw up uh, problems about their uh, distribution, their popularity, and their appropriate use. Thank you. Great, thanks for these questions that have come in. Um, the first one is, what's your take on the Roald Dahl censorship? So that's an interesting uh, case. I don't know how, um, how much it's been an, an issue here in the U US. So I'm obviously uh, only just arrived in from the UK. But in the UK, the commentary has been about uh, uh, offensive terms in Dahl's novels being... Uh, rewritten with the uh, full cooperation of the Roald Dahl estate and the publishers uh, to present them for uh, new audiences. It's a really interesting example of censorship. It is censorship, but it's a kind of censorship I talk about quite a lot in my book. It's a censorship which enables the book or is designed to make the book more accessible and to have a wider circulation rather than a kind of censorship which is intended to withdraw the book from circulation. So we tend to think of censorship as stopping things being published. But there's a lot of, as it were, enabling censorship, which suggests this is the way this book can be acceptable uh, or can be uh, economically uh, successful. Dahl's books seem to me to have always been rewritten, and quite appropriately. Uh, the, we, we, you may know about... Uh, and that, that hasn't just happened now. There was a, certainly a, a round of rewriting in the 70s and the 80s. The Oompa Loompas, the uh, workers uh, in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, have undergone a really fascinating series of changes as we have become more conscious of uh, what it means to be uh, an enslaved person to start with, you know, a kind of colonially appropriated person. Uh, 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 you know, an ununionized worker. They have that, that's been changing for uh, 30 years, so it isn't, it isn't new now. And the other thing I would notice is, uh, after about 10 days of high um, political culture war dudgeon in the UK, the publishers announced that they would also be reprinting the unredacted version of these novels for people who wanted the traditional Roald Dahl which I think made many of us think perhaps this had been a publicity stunt, rather like, <laughs> rather like the burning of portable magic on the steps uh, of the New York Public Library. <laughs> what to do about Mein Kampf? Is it immoral to sell it if you're a bookseller? It's really, I mean, uh, when I said, you know, the problem with book burning is, you know, either, either you're against it or, or, or you're not. If you are against it, you're, the, the consequences of that are that you have to allow things that you don't that, that you think are, uh, are wrong, terrible, dangerous, whatever. You probably have to allow them uh, to be published too. I think that's a very difficult position uh, to be in. It's a difficult position to defend, and I don't suggest that I have got the uh, the the answers here. What's interesting is what they have done in Germany in the last. Uh, two or three years. So Mein Kampf was never uh, banned, interestingly, unlike, say, the Hitler salute, um, other uh, 
apparatus, Nazi apparatus. What happened to Mein Kampf was it's, uh, it, the rights went to the Bavarian state government and they chose not to reprint. But the copyright restrictions lapsed in 2021, I think. Um, and what happened in Germany was, it was a really, really interesting in two directions. One publisher uh, published an, an, an exact reproduction of the, one of the millions of copies that were printed in the 1930s uh, with a picture of Hitler on the front, uh, and a red, red jacket, red, red dust jacket, which is how they always were, uh, and um, kind of black letter. Uh, mein Kampf across, very, very familiar sort of iconic uh, cover, um, I, and just said, this is, the people have a right to read this. A kind of libertarian printer. Uh, and the state uh, sponsored uh, an enormously elaborate critical edition uh, in two volumes, where each uh, page of the text was surrounded with commentary and uh, argument and uh, you know, resituating and framing and so on. So you couldn't possibly read the book s sort of without engaging with uh, the argument about it. Uh, it was, that was a very expensive edition, which was also designed to uh, restrict access uh, effectively. It was not going to be a bestseller, um, but it was also sponsored uh, by a kind of uh, academic um, uh, grant, which meant that there was no question of royalties, which had been one of the other problems. Uh, so that, in some ways, was a was a was a solution, uh, but it uh, it had the disadvantage for many people of making Mein Kampf uh, look like a serious work. So look like a work that, like I don't know, the Hebrew Scriptures or the um, Aristotle's poetics or something, you would have, you know, you would want to have the full apparatus around it to understand it, and that to do that was to dignify it in a way which was uh, uh, completely inappropriate. So it's a very, very difficult, it's a very, very difficult question. And Mein Kampf too has had the, um, the kind of banning, not banning problem. Amazon decided that they would ban it. Uh, everybody rushed to buy it. Uh, you know, it, they, they, they rescinded on, on that. Uh, so it's, it's an ongoing problem. And for a long time after the war, there were charities in the US and the UK that were willing to take the profits to use uh, for charitable work. But in, gradually, I think all of them have felt that this is now, this is no longer appropriate. So uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult question indeed. Our anti-literacy programs a form of book burning? Yeah, that's a really great question, and it brings out the way that book burning has become uh, a metaphor for all kinds of ways of um, restricting knowledge. And I suppose what I was trying to argue uh, was that book burning is quite a specific... To return book burning to a quite specific kind of material act of damage to a particular copy of a book at a particular moment and to, to, to try to restrict its meaning so that it's not quite such a, a kind of grab bag for all the questions there are about sort of censorship um, and uh, the, restriction, the restriction of knowledge. But um, certainly uh, literacy and uh, freedom to read are uh, connected and ne necessary parts of a functioning a functioning society, most definitely. I think that might be all of our questions. I don't know if anybody does. Any, does anybody have anything that they want to add? Okay. Hi, I direct a nonprofit that resells books for the benefit of a public library, and I'm interested in more of your thoughts on how people identify so personally 
with books and what they represent to them on a psychological and on the spiritual level. When seeing the photograph you showed of publishers getting rid of used books, we have so many books we have to get rid of because of damage of soil on them. If peop when people find out we're destroying Bibles, I cannot tell you the arguments we get in. People take the destruction of books so personally. I get into arguments almost weekly with people explaining why we have to get rid of some books. And I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on maybe how you identify with your collection of books. Has doing this research, has this made you um, kind of trim down your collection of books? Do you identify with them less? But I just find that when I talk to people who donate books and buy books, to me they represent our aspirations and our dreams. Giving them away is hard to do. Um, so I would love your thoughts on that and also how you identify with the books that you own. Thanks. That's a really, really great um, um, question and, and context from the, which the question uh, comes. I, yeah, I, th I think we, we identify, many of us identify with books more than with other kinds of objects. And further, identifying with your books is a different kind of possessiveness in our society from other kinds of possessiveness. So if I own more books than I can ever read in the rest of my life, I am an intellectual. <laughs> if I own more shoes than I could wear in a, you know, in a year, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an idiot, I'm an airhead. Um, if I own more cars than I can drive, you know, I'm compensating for something that we don't know what. So, so, so you see that, that book, book possession has a different, you know, operates in a different sphere from the, the possession of other kinds of objects. And I've heard people maybe talking from a similar position to you, perhaps in a more general uh, second-hand market or charity shop, as we would call them in the UK, when they themselves find it quite easy to chuck out uh, chipped china or bits and pieces like that. But they, even when they see books that are damaged and that need to be thrown away and can't be resold, they find that, you know, they find that a very a different kind of, uh, kind of experience. There's, there's one aspect of that which I think is to do with the sacred origins of books. I think culturally we have not got rid of that. Uh, even though our book contents have mostly changed you know, far away from that. I think very, very hardwired is a sense that the book is a, is a, is a say, in, in, uh, in many cultures, is that the book is, a, is, is always or perforce a sacred object. But I think there are ways that books, uh, sometimes I look at my books and I think about books that I own that I'm never going to, I know I'm not going to read again, but that they represent a kind of, biography or something, you know, time in my life when that's what I was reading or that's what I was interested in or that's what somebody gave me. Um, and I think that sense of um, what, what we've come to understand as the shelfie, that the, the idea that we are created by our books or that our books reflect us in particular ways, I think that's, uh, that's a, a long-standing part of, of, book, uh, of book ownership. One aspect of the second-hand book market I find, uh, where I find this question of our investment so poignant is when you find books uh, that have been inscribed in a second-hand store. And so you, you, you open a book and it says, you know, to my darling, you know, whoever... Um, there's a whole website of these called bookdedications.com. It's a somehow a really morbid kind of pleasure looking through <laughs> and thinking what what happened to this, um, what, you know, what happened to this great uh, great love affair, or what happened to to this, or or, or even you know looking in um, some. Uh, I don't collect. Well, I was going to say I don't collect books. I seem to acquire books, which I suppose in a way that means I do collect them. I don't go out looking for particular kinds of books, except in a way like most people uh, in middle age. I'm sort of interested in my, in my children's, in the, in the books I had as a child, and thinking I can't think why I got rid of those, and maybe I'll try and recover those copies, but I need them to be in the editions 
that they were, and uh, not in the modern, modern editions. Um, and sometimes I find it very, very spooky to see in a child's book, you know, to Angela from Mummy, you know, 1972 or something, and you, the, 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 because that's a moment of uh, um, free, freeze framing a, a life uh, in the in that moment in the pages of that book, which has moved on in all kinds of ways since. So I think I think there are ways that books. Um, that we can invest ourselves and parts of our personality and parts of our history in books, which is less available to us in, 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 many, in many other objects. Um, and it's partly, I think, the reason, just to finish that, um, although I could keep talking about it, as you can tell, it's partly the reason, I think, that people's books after they have died are so sad. Because even books that, ha that have been, you know, um, seemed quite... Uh, valuable, quite lively, uh, lose their life immediately. The person who put that collection together has gone and they become really kind of so much lumber uh, on the shelves. So, so they've, they, the, the life has gone, has gone from them in some quite real way. So enjoy them while you have them, but don't expect your descendants to, do, to, ca to care about them. I think that's, that, that, would be, that would be my instruction. And I think there's just one, one more. Hi. There's the concept of diminishing returns in all kinds of fields. And when I heard many years ago that the publishing industry produces 25,000 new books a year, I thought, how is anyone ever going to absorb that much information over a very long period of time? So uh, what's your thought on the fact that maybe we've reached a saturation point and we shouldn't produce any more books? Just read the ones that have been produced since Guttenberg. I, I heard there was a really good one produced just last year. <laughs> I, 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 we could have a little moratorium while everybody catches up with my, with my books. No, I, jo joking apart, I think... Um, well, I'm not an expert on the economics of the publishing industry by any means. I think what has happened is what the same thing that's happened in many uh, areas of advanced capitalism, like, for example, the fact that 50 years ago there might have been three brands of breakfast cereal in a standard supermarket, and now there are 53. That's to say a huge proliferation of choice and you know fewer fewer items of each particular choice, but aggregated across a much wider choice, being one of the economic models that we are we, we all we all enjoy. Um, so we're not in an age now where everybody watches the same TV shows or um, you know wears, buys their clothes in the same place or eats the same um, eats eats the same kind of processed food because there are hundreds of choices. I think books are actually are just a version, uh, a, a version of that. I do, I do have that. Um, uh, one of the things that sometimes I find uh, off-putting is really huge bookshops. They're sort of wonderful, and you think, God, I could get anything here, but you can s sometimes get a bit sort of paralyzed by, by choice, um, which is why often an independent books, bookstore where someone has chosen and curated for you some of the things that they think are worth your reading is really a great place to get to get your books because the choice has already been reduced for you in a but it, but in a but in a really helpful way. So yeah, I, I mean I, I share that um, I, I, I share that sense. We are having more and more and more books, um, but that just means probably it's it's um, the job is to seek out the ones. From the from now or from the past that you, that you find meaningful. We lack the art of the sermon or the certain discernment. discernment. I'm so sorry, discernment. Well, that I can see I can see somebody at the back saying we can't we can't go to discernment at this point in the in the in the evening, um, uh, for which I which I apologise. Perhaps we'll all have to ponder on that. Uh, as we as we go thank you so much for your time this evening thank you. Thank you.